it's the Parsha of Vayikra. Um, Vayikra is known as the Book of Sacrifices. It deals with, um, with sac uh, primarily with many things, but one of the things it spends a lot of time in is the whole idea of sacrifices and the different types of sacrifices. Some of them have been referred to earlier, and the idea of sacrifices found in the Book of Bereshis is a little bit different um, than, the, than them here. So let's first discuss the idea of sacrifices in general before we get into the specifics. So the first thing is, is that the English word sacrifice, which is probably the closest translation to what a sacrifice is in Hebrew, is actually quite flawed. It's, it's really not a very good translation. The, the idea of a sacrifice, as we know is, and, and from the English word sacrifice, is that you are giving up something basically you're wasting it. You're taking something that has a worth and you're destroying it for a purpose. Like I sacrifice, you know, <coughs> let's say I'm going to sacrifice my job for my family. So I, that means I'm going to, my job is going to fail right, or be in trouble or not do as well because something that's more important. right? So I'm giving up something, something I'm lo losing something. That's what a sacrifice is. And then we have it in many ways. In baseball, you, you, know, you sacrifice one player is is out because so the other one can get a home run so you're giving up something right but that's that idea when you're talking about offering animals to god or things to god in the outside world that we live in that word sacrifice makes a lot of sense because how the outside world looks at sacrifices is that sacrifices are that you feel indebted to god and you want to give something to god so you take something that's worth money and you destroy it. You take this animal, you kill it, you totally burn it up on the altar. All that's left is ashes and smoke. And that action that you've done, you feel that you have now taken something and given it up for God. But you have totally destroyed it. It's totally gone. It's totally burnt up. If I would say to you that you should, that, that you should take a sacrifice and you put it on the altar, you kill it, you put it on the altar, and you put it on the fire, and then you take it off and eat it, you would say, that's not a sacrifice. Right? You may not say that, but that's what people would say. That's not a sacrifice. Uh, that's, that's having a barbecue, right? a, a bry, right? Yeah. Right? right? That's what it is. It's not a sacrifice. Sacrifice is you take the animal and you destroy it. You lose it. So the, the idea is, is that, the, that the difference between what we the Jews see as a sacrifice and what the world sees as a sacrifice is the difference in that example. For a, the world, a sacrifice has to be destroyed, lost, given up, even a waste for another purpose or for a higher purpose. We say that a sacrifice is not that at all. A sacrifice in Hebrew comes from the word karbon and karbon has as its root word karev which means to bring close. That is to say that in our relationship with God, we want to go get close to God. One of the ways that we can get close to God is by offering a sacrifice. However, the purpose of the sacrifice is to not get rid of the debt we have to God by giving him this cow, destroying this cow. It is to bring me closer to God. And therefore, we take an animal, we offer it, we kill it, kosher, we offer it on the altar, a portion of that animal is burnt up usually a portion of that animal is given to the Kohen right who works on our behalf and he uses that to eat he eats that and a portion is is eaten by the off the person who brings the sacrifice in the first place so that's a radical different idea but what you're doing is you're taking an animal which is a physical thing you you kill it kosher you dedicate it to the temple you offer it as a as a uh, as a korban, as a sacrifice. And what you're doing now is you're taking a physical entity and you're raising that physical entity to a spiritual level. Like, how could a cow be spiritual? It can't be spiritual. It's a cow. It, can't, it, doesn't, it barely thinks. Everything it does is instinct. The idea that we can take an animal and through the actions we do, we can raise that animal up to make it a, have a spiritual aspect. And then when we use that animal, we, that spirituality enters us and the energy we get from eating that animal, we do good things with. So therefore, we have now raised that animal to a higher level and raised ourselves to a higher level, therefore bringing us closer to God. 
So our idea of a sacrifice is not giving up something. It is not burning up something. It is not taking it and offering it to God as if God wants a cow. What's he going to do with it? But we understand that what it really is is our ability to take something physical, to put it into the environment of holiness, which is the temple, to use it in a certain way, and then we can raise the level of that animal, and through consuming the animal, we raise our level. That's one type of sacrifice. There's other types of sacrifices that are offered to, um, to you have with all your friends. You bring your friends with you, like this is a Corbin Toda, a thank you sacrifice. God saves your life. And you go on a boat across the ocean, and, you're, and, some, and you have a storm, you come to the land, and you say, thank God, he saved, he saved my life, I want to offer a sacrifice. So you make this thank you sacrifice. And you invite all your friends, and you go and you slaughter the animal, you offer it on the altar, and everybody eats it. And so that's the same idea. Here and now your friends unite with you to thank God. You tell the story of how God helped you. And they all eat this food, and it helps raise their spiritual levels. So for us, a Corbin is extremely, extremely different than the rest of the world sees sacrifices. Even the word sacrifice is not correct for us. And it can very easily be extrapolated, not only in the area of a sacrifice, but in everything. Everything in Jewish life is the using of the physical world to raise it to become spiritual, and then we use it for us to become spiritual. When it comes to the outside world, the outside world has no concept of this. So the outside world says the physical world is here to deter us from being spiritual. And the physical world wants us to eat and to have relations and to spend time raising children and to have discussions with our spouse and to have to look for money. That's the physical world. It does everything it can to take us away from the spiritual world. And what do they say the spiritual world is? That's sitting up on a mountain, like in the Himalayas, and contemplating the universe, and not being involved in business, and not being married, and dedicating oneself to spirituality. That's how the world sees the spiritual world. It is the opposite of the physical world. The physical world has, it has as its goal to put, keep you away from the spiritual world, and the spiritual world is totally separate from the physical world. That's how the world sees it, but that's not how we see it, because that fits the world's word sacrifice. For us, we see the physical world as a vehicle to become spiritual. You need the physical world. If you don't have money, you can't buy a lulav and esro. You can't buy matzah. You can't have a Passover seder. You have to have money to do these things. Money is physical. In order for you to fulfill the mitzvah of Pes on Pesach, you have to eat matzah. That's physical. You have to shake a lulav on sukkahs. That's physical. Everything is physical with us, and we take the physical and we raise it up. While the rest of the world says, no, if I'm going to have to get married, and I'm going to have to have children, and I'm going to have to do business, I'm not going to be spiritual. I'm going to spend all my time in mundane things. I want to be spiritual. I'm going to make a, take an oath to not speak. I'm going to take an oath to not get married. I'm going to take an oath not to collect money. I'm going to live up in the middle of nowhere, and I'm going to be spiritual. And, and it may work, but that's not how we do it. That's how they do it. And the entire book of Ayikra deals with various sacrifices, which within the description of the sacrifice have purposes of raising us spiritually in different ways. This sacrifice is in this way, and this one is in that way. But the whole purpose is to raise us up, not as the non-Jews think. Okay, so as we go through the area of sacrifices, which seems, most people find them very gory. You know, the thing about taking a cow and slaughtering it, and putting it on the altar, and then cutting up the meat that you barbecued, and you eating some, your friends eating some, the Kohen eating some, some gets burnt up, and all of this type of thing, right, it sounds pretty gory. You know, like... Like when people say, you hear often from non-observant Jews, they'll say, you know, the sacrifices is barbaric. We don't do this kind of stuff anymore. And for the most part, we believe that we will do them again. And it's not at all barbaric. It's no, it is not any different than when you go to barbecue a cow on your barbecue in the backyard, <coughs> except it has a spiritual aspect, which barbecuing in our backyard has less of a spiritual aspect. And that's really it. So as we read through this, we're going to discuss some of the various sacrifices and how they relate to this concept. It's going to be going over the next four or five weeks. But the Parsha begins by saying, Vayikra el Moshe ve'davar Hashem alav me'ol mo'ed le'mor. And God, it says, he calls out to Moshe. God spoke to him 
from the tent of meeting. And he says the following. Now the first thing you'll notice in the word Vayikra, you'll notice the Aleph is small. You know, see how the Hebrew word, the first word, the, the letters are all a certain height except for the last letter, it's smaller. Right? It's odd, right? It's not normal. They print a book in such a way. You see that right there? Vayikra and the small Aleph, the first word. So the commentaries tell us that this was done by Moshe, not by God, although God agreed to it, otherwise it wouldn't be there. And it was done in a very particular reason. The word Vayikra, as many other words, have, have, have deeper meaning. The word Vayikra means God, someone called. Vayikra, I called. If I want to call you, if I want to call your name out and, and get you to come, call you on the phone, Vayikra would fit. Right? Now, that is not, not only does it mean that, but it also has on a higher level or on a, a more subtle level, when that word is used, that not only means Vayikra, that I called you, but it means that I have a fec affection for you. I'm calling somebody I like. If, if you use the word Vayikra to call someone, that means you're calling someone you like. There's other words in Hebrew that means to call, which doesn't, <coughs> doesn't mean that you like them. It might, it might mean nothing, just that you call them. So here you see that God is calling Moshe, and it's telling us that he likes Moshe, and that's why he's calling him. That Moshe has a very intense, positive, relationship with God. He was the savior of the Jews. He led the Jews out of Egypt. He received the Torah on our behalf. All of the things that Moshe does, he's prepared to give up his life for the Jewish people. All of these examples of what um, what Moshe does with, uh, with his relationship with Hashem are all showing us how dear Moshe is to God. And therefore, God uses the word Vayikra. However, if you look, for instance, in a few places in the Torah, one notable one is with Bilaam. Now, later on in the Torah, we're going to talk about Bilaam. Bilaam was a non-Jewish prophet who, in his way, the commentaries say, was the non-Jewish equal to Moshe. As Moshe was the greatest prophet and leader of the Jewish people, Bilaam also, for the non-Jews, was the greatest prophet they had. And he was a prophet, a real prophet. And he was not Jewish. And it says that when, when God wanted to speak to him, it uses the word Vayikar, which is the same word as Vayikra, with the Aleph missing. And there, the word also means he called. However, the connotation of the word, just like in this our case with Moshe, it means that he likes him. In this case, it's saying the word vayikar means random. He's calling him randomly. That is to say, God is calling Bilam, but he just happens to call him. He didn't plan to call him. It's like if you like somebody, you know, oh, tomorrow I'm going to call my friend. All right? And you think about it, and you plan, and then you have a certain time and you call your friend. But this, this word, right, that's with Moshe and God. But with Bilaam, he takes off the Aleph and it means happenstance. Like God happened upon him. God was, so to speak, a man's walking down the street and he happens to see a cousin. Right? That's called the Yikar. If he's walking down the street and he arranged to see his cousin who he loves, that would be Vayikra. He's calling him because he likes him. And Vayikar means he's calling him because he happens to see him. Right? It's just no, no positive feeling there. He just happens to see him. So he says that you're walking in the mall, you see an acquaintance, you say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Right? That's not necessarily because you love him. It's because you see him. You want to be polite. You want to be civil. You say hello to people. So Moshe felt that he did not want that the Torah should say that God called out to him in love. When Bilaam, it says, that, who's a, who was a prophet also, it says that God called out to him just coincidentally. So Moshe wanted to take the letter Aleph off that word and, that, and he used the same word for himself to not segregate him out from their others. But God wouldn't allow it. So he put the Aleph smaller so that you'd notice it and you'd say, why is it smaller? And it's because Moshe wanted to take the Aleph off because he was a humble person and he did not want that it should show for eternity that he was treated better than Bilaam because of who he was. And therefore he make, makes the Aleph smaller. Um, the commentary is asked, how is that possible? How can Moshe go and just change the Torah? Because he chooses to change the Torah. God says, I want everybody to know that I, that I have affection for you. So I use the word Vayikra. Moshe is humble, so he doesn't want to, that he should be singled out. So he wants to take the Aleph off. Well, it's too bad for Moshe. God wrote the Torah, not Moshe. You can't just change a book because you don't like it, right? You don't go buy a book in the library and then, like, I don't like the ending of this book. You tear it out and write a new one. 
You don't do that. So Moshe also can't do that. So how is it that he does it? He makes the letter Aleph small. And they, so the commentary said the reason is is that when when God originally gave most of the Torah, the Torah was one word. The whole Torah, all five books, was one word. It was one word in that that God gave him the whole Torah exactly as we have it, but it didn't have any spaces between the words. So in our Torah, of course, there's spaces between the words, spaces between the sentences, the paragraphs, and the chapters. Right? In, the, in this one, it was just letters, one after another, in order. And, and then Moshe had to take the letters, the words that were hidden in there, and separate them out in order to have the Torah. So what was the purpose of that? Because God was sending a message. The Torah has many meanings. Depending how you separate the words and how you look into the words, it will tell you more than just what the words say themselves. Right? That's what we find out about the Torah. So in this case, Moshe wanted to separate the word by putting the Aleph with the next word. Right? Well, he, he didn't want to change the Torah. The last letter of Vayikra is Aleph. He wanted to take the Aleph from Vayikra, put it together with the word El, and take it off Vayikra. And so therefore it's a Vayakar. It was randomly God called him. So it wasn't that Moshe was changing the Torah. Moshe wanted to change the way he interpreted the Torah, which would have been legitimate. But the message that God is saying is that Bilam and, and, and Moshe were very similar. In the essence of who they were, they were both very similar. They were both great prophets. They were both very wealthy. They were both very successful leaders. And yet, they were extremely different. Moshe is, for eternity, remembered as the great king, savior, lover of the Jewish people. And Bilam, for all eternity, is known as the man who hated Jews. He hated the Jews. He wanted to destroy the Jews. And, and we say, how can you have such differences? Because there were so much similarities between them. And the point is that, the, that Moshe, like when, when Moshe and, and, and through, well, God and Moshe through him, um, write, have in the Torah how Moshe is called and how Bilam is called, you see that ultimately, even though while in the wor- when we're living in this world, it often appears that people who do wrong get ahead. Right? You, you can see people who are in business and they're shady in business. And they make millions of dollars. Now the guy who's honest is barely getting by. So that's that's not just. That's not how the world should be. And the idea that the person is able to get millions of dollars, right, for whatever it is he's doing that's not crooked, that is crooked, we've, what we actually know is in the end, he will not benefit from this money. It was no benefit for him. He can't steal money and benefit from it. Not that you can't because the law is against it. It's the reality of the world. The law is against it because God created the world that it won't work that way. So while it looks to us that certain criminal kinds of people, uh, you know, the guys from the drug cartels and things are all very rich and they have wonderful lives of leisure, the reality is it's not the case. It appears that they do, but really, in the long run, the people who follow the Torah are the people who are going to be able to have the good things, have, have a life that has meaning and purpose, while the other people eventually and one day will come where they it becomes real that their that the money that they have is really nothing, and you see that you know sometimes we think people are being funny, but some but on occasion if you have a relative who's very wealthy, a child, a relative, a friend, you know when you talk to them about it, they they often see the fact that they're wealthy much different than we do, and they see all the troubles that wealth gives them, and we don't see those troubles. You just say you know I don't I don't think I'd mind those troubles. That's what people say. But the truth is that in my counseling, and in my work that I do, I see all the time people who ha- who don't have to worry about money. They could live a nice upper middle class or even wealthy life, the rest of their life, and not work again. And yet they have so many troubles in their lives. So many things happen. Because money is not the answer, of course. Money is not what gives us happiness. Money can make life less difficult, <clears throat> but also it can make much more difficulty. And, and I see it. You see when... When you have a patriarch and a family of wealthy people dies, and he's the one who made all the money, and all the fighting that goes on, who gets the money, and who gets this much money, and that much money. When, you know, you're talking about people who didn't even necessarily work for the money. It's their father, and it's due to them. But you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So this one gets 100 million, this one gets 80 million. Does it make a big difference? Well, to them, their family falls apart because of it. And we would never do that in our families. So you see that there are pitfalls. So Moshe... He wanted that. Uh, he wanted it understood that when it comes to who I am, I'm just like Bilam. I'm a prophet. He's a prophet. I'm wealthy. He's wealthy. 
but we, we, when it comes to what I have done and what I have become, I'm very different. So Moshe innately wanted to make the word very similar to the word of Bilaam. So that a person shouldn't say, well, Moshe was given every asset, and Moshe was given uh, you know, a great life. So of course Moshe is, is going to succeed with God. And Bilaam, not necessarily. He said, no, that's not the case. They're both the same. The fact that Moshe succeeded is because Moshe tried. He made the effort. He put his effort into succeeding and to being righteous and to being a good person. While Bilaam did not. And therefore Bilaam became who he was and and we find that Moshe becomes who he is. And that's really how the Parsha begins. Now it says here that he is that he's that Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting. And then it says what he says to him. But again, what does this mean that he spoke to him from the tent of meeting? That God is only inside of this Mishkan, this temple that we built. That's where God is and then Moshe wanted to speak to him, he had to go there and God would speak to him and the answer is yes. Up until this point in history, God allowed sacrifices and he allowed and he had the ability and people had the ability to have close react um, in, a, in a close relationship with God um, anywhere you were any place you were you didn't need to go to a temple but because of the sin of the golden calf and the and what happened to the Jewish people because of it the, the level of the people changed so then the only way they could relate to God was to go to a special building that was made for God and then they could relate to God but they couldn't do it all the time in their life as they used to they had to go there. And that was called the Mishkan, or the portable temple, or, or the Oel Moed, which is within it. So here we have the Oel Moed, and Moshe, God is calling out to Moshe from the Oel Moed. That's where he is. All right? He is in that thing. So, um, so the commentaries often ask, how is it that Moshe heard him, he had to go to the Oel Moed, he had to go to this tent inside of the Mishkan in order to hear God. So did God whisper? Is that what it was? You had to go right up to, because up to the temple because he couldn't hear him because he was whispering. So it says no. It quotes from Psalms that when God's voice comes out, it shatters the Lebanon. I mean, that is the cedar trees. The cedar trees shake because God's voice is so loud. So if God's voice is so loud, then people should be able to hear him outside the temple, not just inside the temple. But we know that not only is God's voice loud, but he can he only could be heard from inside. So that's why it says from the Olamoe, because that's where, he, where the voice came from, and that's where the voice stayed. And it was done miraculously. And um, yet the voice was loud, but yet as soon as you stepped outside, you couldn't hear the voice. And people all question, why is it? What is the message the Torah is telling us with this? And I believe that we can understand that the message that the Torah is saying, when it comes to, a, um, uh, you know, that, that a, person, a person wants to talk to God, God has a very loud voice. But yet, if you're not standing within the temple, you couldn't hear it. You could be standing one foot away, outside the edge of the temple. It didn't even necessarily have solid walls, and you can't hear God. But inside, you could. And this is, teaches a, a lesson that, that when it comes to people, many, many people don't have the ability to listen to God. That is to say that they themselves are, um, they overlook it. They don't think about it. They don't work at it. They don't try to become close to God, and therefore, they can't talk to God. They, they don't have the ability to have a conversation in such a way. They can't communicate with God. Moshe could. The idea of God's voice being so loud, but yet you can't hear it from outside, means that if you see yourself as an outsider, a person who's not a part of the Jewish establishment, not a part of the Jewish life following the Torah, then you're basically, by seeing yourself as an outsider, you are basically separating yourself from, from this, and you're saying, I, I don't have the ability to hear God. And in other words, it, I can't hear it. I can't, I don't understand it. And therefore, the, it's telling us that every person has the ability to hear God, and every person has the ability to understand God, but you have to choose to do it. You have to go to the temple to do it. You can't just simply have it done wherever you are. And that's why it says that Moshe spoke, uh, that God spoke to him from the Oval Moed, that it begins with. And then it goes into some sacrifices, all different types of sacrifices. Um, now, one of the interesting things that it talks about in the sacrifices, it says that there was um, there is a certain sacrifice that has to be given by a person. When the person gives that, it, they use a cow. But, but it says, but if a poor person gives it, they would take flour. And a cow, let's say a cow costs $3,000. Right? A little bit of flour costs about eight cents. So the poor person 
he uses a little bit of flour because he can't afford to give a cow to God. He doesn't have the money. God didn't give him the money. So he uses flour. But the other person, right, the wealthier person or the middle class person has to give a cow. And the commentaries say that the Torah tells us a few lines later that, that God accepts the sacrifice of the poor person. And so the commentators want to know why is God favoring the sacrifice of the poor person? Here, imagine, the rich person is spending $3,000 on a cow, and he's offering it as a sacrifice. But the poor person is spending about $0.08 cents on flour, and he's offering a sacrifice. And, when, and, and God says that I favor the sacrifice of the poor person. But why would he do that? It's just a couple of cents. Why would that be favored? Well, he's got such a little also there. Well, so that's, what, right? that's one of the answers, that if you look at it percentage-wise, where a poor, poor person, let's say, makes you know, $100 a month, and a rich person makes a million dollars a month. So the poor person, to give a dollar is to give 1% of his salary, right? But, but a rich person, to give a dollar, he's giving 0.001% of his salary. is nothing. So, so we say that even one of the answers that you're saying is that because the poor person has so little, when he gives a little, it's actually a higher percentage of what he has than the, what the rich person has. So therefore, what he does is a greater thing. But the commentaries say that there's got to be more to it than that. And they say, in addition, another answer that the, to try to show the, the differences and, and why there's, um, the poor person seems to be favored. And here it's because when a rich person goes and buys a cow, so basically the person goes and he says, look, what do you want from me? I made a mistake. I have to offer a sacrifice. I go out and I spend $3,000 on a cow. So I go and I do it and I slaughter it and I give it to the Kohen and I eat it and everything's fine. That's the end of it. In other words, he feels God, he did something wrong. God gives him an obligation of how to fix it. It's like a business deal. I did something wrong. You want me to fix it? I fixed it. I did a business deal. There was not necessarily any heart, any soul in there. There might have been, but not necessarily. But with the poor person who has to give flour, he knows that that flour costs nothing. There is no way that he could misconstrue and say, all right, I've done my bit. I gave my cow. Because he spent a couple of pennies. So what does he do? He has to put himself into it. He has to feel he feels that, about what, what he did wrong and how he can fix it. He feels thankful to God for giving him the opportunity to repent and to be clean from his sins. And therefore, you see that the actions of the poor person have much more feeling and care than the actions of the wealthy person, of course, in the stereotypical example. And therefore, God loves the sacrifice of the poor people even more because they put themselves into it while the rich person does not necessarily do that. And that's one of the reasons that it, it, it tells us that. Yeah, Rabbi. Yeah. Uh, we are not allowed to eat the that part of the cow. Right, but not for this reason. But yes, it's true. So when when it gets burned, do they burn in full the back part of the the animal? Let's say that again. I know, Sam. We don't eat the back the part, part of the cow. Of the cow. So in other words, they eat the, only the front. Okay, so let me explain it. You're referring to what's called the Ginha Nusha. We find it in the book of Brachis. It's called the uh, sciatic nerve. Mm -hmm. And in a cow, it's about the size of your thumb, as far as its thickness, but it's very long. It's the longest nerve in the body, in all um, animals, including humans. It's a big nerve. And it's, it says that when Yaakov fought with the angel, the angel injured him. He injured him in that area. And therefore, it says that forever the Jewish people will not eat that. So therefore, when you kill a cow, you can't eat that part. Today, we don't know exactly everything of every part of that thing. In other words, we know what it is, but it has all of these, you know, it has like all of these tributaries and these sort of like branches coming off it, going into other nerves and going throughout the body. And we can't really define exactly what we're not allowed to eat. So we say, we know we're not allowed to eat it, but we don't know how much we're not allowed to eat, so we're going to take that whole part of the animal and not eat it. When in reality, if we knew how, there would just be a piece like maybe this big, right? this, this size, but long, from the animal you couldn't eat and everything else you could eat. But that's because we don't have the knowledge. Back then they had the knowledge. So when they offered the sacrifice, they would cut out the forbidden fats, cut out the gidanusha, and they would eat the rest. 
Today we don't know. Now there are Svartim, Svartic Jews, who say that they do know. That they have a tradition as to what exactly they can take out and what they can't. And that's why you will find that in some Svartic restaurants that have a certification that is kosher by Svartic rabbis will offer parts of the cow that we don't have, like the filet mignon, which comes from that part of the cow that we don't eat because we don't know how to separate it, but the Svartim eat it because they know how to separate it, or they say they know how. We don't have the tradition. They say they do have the tradition, and they, they could, and then that's why they do it. So that's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, let's see. All right, we have a, a, you know, a lot of discussion in here about the Kohen. Because the Kohen's job is, uh, is to really facilitate the sacrifices. He kills the animal. He cuts up the animal. He sprinkles the blood. He moves the parts of the animal around. He offers it in different ways. He, he has total, right, total, everything is really him. And, here, and, and when they refer to the Kohen here, of course, while it could be any Kohen, because all Kohanim are the same, there is constant reference to the Kohen, meaning our own. Our own is the Kohen. He is the perfect example of a Kohen. And the commentaries say that, that there are a number of reasons that we say that about him. And one of them was his ability and his desire to unify people. Because what is really the job of a Kohen? The job of a Kohen is to help people because of things they've done, become close to God again, to fix their errors by offering sacrifices. Also to offer sacrifices on behalf of the Jewish people as a whole because they have certain things that they, that they may have done wrong or that they need to fix and deal with. So therefore they also have, um, the Cohen does that. The Cohen's job is to make peace between the Jewish people and God. Aaron Cohen saw that the ability for Jews to have peace among themselves within families, within neighborhoods, right, Jews to get along is just as important. And Aaron dedicated himself to doing just that. Aaron's goal in life was to cause Jews to get along with God and to get along with each other. So it says that Aaron was Ohev Shalom and Rodeh Shalom. He loved peace and he chased after peace. So to love peace, I understand. And I love peace, so I'll do everything I can to make peace. But what does it mean he ran after peace? In fact, the word rodef is a colloquialism. It's a, it's a slang expression in the Torah for a, for a murderer, a pursuer. Like somebody who wants to murder somebody will have to run after him, he'll pursue him. So that's called a rodef. When we say, that person's a rodef, I'm saying is that person is trying to hurt someone else. Right? He's running after him to hurt him. Literally, that's not what it means, but it's an expression. So when we say that Aaron was a lover of peace and he was a rodef, he ran after peace like he's going to kill it, it doesn't sound like the right word to use. You say he loved peace and he, you know, and he worked at peace or he went out of his way to make peace. He wanted that people should get along, but that he pursued it is a funny word. You know, the Torah is telling us, or the athletes of our fathers and so forth are telling us that the, that the idea of the Kohen, of Aaron a Kohen, loving peace, that means that Aaron would go, and he would. People would be fighting, and he would help them make up. But to pursue peace is, it means that he went beyond that. Pursuing peace is that is what Aaron did, and we've heard this before. Is that Aaron would see a two people fighting, so he would go to the first one and he'd say, you know, you know your your friend here who you're fighting with now, he is, you know, he has a bit of an ego, and he knows that he did something wrong to you. And he feels bad about it. He doesn't want to do something wrong to you. He feels bad. But his ego won't let him apologize. Because he's a little arrogant. So I'm telling you that if you would go over to him and you would apologize to him, he'll immediately say to you, no, 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 it was my fault and I apologize. So would you do that? So the guy says, okay. So then he goes to the other guy. He does the exact same thing. You tell the other guy, this guy's got a bit of an ego problem. If you go and apologize, he'll say okay, right? So they two come together and they both apologize to each other, and now there's peace. So, so that's what Aaron would do. Now, the fact that he loved peace, 
was that he went out of his way for peace, but that he pursued peace like a person pursuing in a murder. That your, your passion, your emotion are in it, is exactly doing this. Because what he did was really not honest, right? He was allowed to do it. He was, you're allowed to do this for the sake of peace, but it's not really honest. Because neither guy said that he wants to make peace or that it's his fault. Aaron made that up. But the idea was to cause people to have peace with each other, and that's what he did. So that's why he was called a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace, using a word that seems violent and negative, because he was very, very active in trying to do this, even by bending the rule. On the other hand, when in Malachi, in the prophet, Aaron is referred to of having truth on his tongue. That's what it says. He had truth on his tongue. So if he had truth, right, he was always speaking truth, how could he have done these things which aren't true? So here it's referring to something else. You know, it says that, let's say Aaron is walking down the street and he sees a Jew do something wrong. Not necessarily on purpose, maybe, maybe not. He sees him do something wrong. So Aaron goes over to the person in a very nice way and he says, hey, you know, you're not supposed to do it this way, you're supposed to do it this way, or, or you shouldn't eat this now, or you shouldn't do this now, whatever it was he saw. But he says it in a very nice way. And the person who hears him realizes he did something wrong, so he thanks Aaron, and he goes along his way. Now, maybe he's sincere, maybe he's not sincere, the guy who's, who did something wrong. But the next time the occasion arises that he's going to do the same thing, he thinks about Aaron, and he says to himself, maybe Aaron's right, maybe he's wrong. But Aaron is such a nice man. He's such a caring man. He really cares about me. How can I do something to go right against what he says? I can't. I can't hurt him like that. So I'm not going to break the rule. I'm going to follow the rule, even if it's wrong. And the reality is it wasn't wrong. The person would say that. But the, right, because, and so Aaron was an amazing, amazingly effective outreach worker. He would go out, and the way he acted and, the, and uh, did things, it's like, you imagine if I go to the mall, and every time I, I see a Jewish person, I say hello, and I speak to them, and I ask how they are, and then I go to the next one, the next one, so that after a while, all of these people who don't even know who I am, they think I'm a nice person, right? So then when they would normally go over to, let's say, an unkosher restaurant in the mall, and they see me, they're going to they're gonna say, how can I do this? The rabbi is here, and... He, you know, and I know he cares about me, and he knows that I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't eat unkosher food because it's bad for me. So he's here. How can I, I do it, right? And that's exactly how it works. That's that is the correct way of outreach. That's how you help people, because you can't help someone in any way, but you certainly can't help them discover the spiritual Jewish life that we have if you don't care about them. And they have to know you care about them. That's what's important. I tell people all the time, there are laws about reprimanding people. If someone does something wrong, you have to tell them they did something wrong. But if you say it and you don't know them, like I tell guys, if you don't know that, that man who did something, if you don't know his wife's name and his kid's name, you don't know him well enough to reprimand him. You have to wait until you do. Because if you know his name and his wife's name and his kid's name, then probably he knows that you care about him. But if you don't know this, he doesn't know. And if you try to correct someone who doesn't think you care, you just want to put another notch on your belt, do another thing I'm supposed to do at your expense, so they're not going to change. But if they do, but if you, on the other hand, you go and you do it, and, and, and you a, a, act in the right manner, then the person will change, and they'll stay changed, because they want to do what's right. So we, we all have to know that when, when we want to try to influence people, we want to help people, we want to expose them to Jewish life, you don't do it with statistics, you don't do it with an amazing class, you really do it the most effective way is by letting them know you care about them, that I really like you, right? And, and, and some people it's natural, like for me, if I don't like somebody, it really means that they really worked at it. Because in general, I like everybody, I like people. And the, the, one of the happiest things I have is to be able to help people. And, you know, people call me up and they'll say, Oh, Rabbi, you know, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I'm having this problem. Can you help me? And I always tell them, you're, you're confused. Uh, I'm busy helping people. That's what I want to do. Right? The paperwork that I have to do and the fundraising that I have to do and the organization that I have to do are necessary evils for me to be able to do what I want to do, which is to help people directly. So don't call me and apologize because you're, you're taking me away from what I'm doing. 
you are giving me to do what I'm supposed to do, what I want to do, which is to work with people. And if people know that, if they know that, that I care about them, they know that you care about them, they know, then they'll listen to you. But if they don't know it, they won't listen to you. And that's very important. Because we all like people, we all care about people, it's just a matter of making sure that people realize it. And not being selfish. Right? Really doing it in the right manner. So that's that's one thing we learn about Aaron from uh, from the way that this week's partial talks about him. So let's take a look at a couple of more of the maybe the offshoots of what it's talking about here. different kinds of sacrifices. So one thing comes up is that one of the most, con there, there are two types of sacrifices that it talks about here. There are what we call communal sacrifices and personal sacrifices. A communal sacrifice is offered for the Jewish people. Right? And, uh, and an individual sacrifice is offered for you. You, uh, you need a sacrifice for whatever reason. God did something good. God did something you didn't like. Whatever it was, you did something wrong. You have to offer a sacrifice. Then there's the sacrifices that are offered for the Jewish people. There's the morning sacrifice, the afternoon sacrifice, the extra sacrifice, the nighttime what sacrifice. Page are we on? Well, daytime. What? What page are we on? Sorry. It's throughout. It, 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 it is the whole parshas about this, okay. about all the different sacrifices and how some are community based and some are personal based. So one of the most common personal ones that you hear all the time is one that is called a chatas, which is a, an offering that is offered for somebody who sins. There's something wrong. Now, you can't offer a sin offering if you sinned on purpose. Like if you went and said, I know I'm, not, I'm supposed to keep kosher. I know I keep kosher, but I am so hungry I'm going to go to McDonald's and buy a hamburger. Right? And you know you shouldn't do it, and you do it. So that's not a mistake. That's on purpose. You can't offer a sacrifice. If a, now, well, if a person goes um, and they forget, let's say they, you know, you get up in the Saturday morning and you're groggy, right? You stayed up late at night, you get up early in the morning and you're groggy, you walk down the hall and you flip the light switch on. Now it's Shabbos, you're not supposed to turn lights on. But you, you didn't turn the light on because you don't care about Shabbos. And you didn't turn the light on because you don't, right, because you want to teach God a lesson. You turn the light on because you're sort of like cloudy, you know, you're not thinking. You're doing it by rote. You just hit the switch. And that, right, when a person does something because they become confused, right, that's a mistake. Right? In other words, you, you made an error. And that's the person who can offer a sacrifice. Right? Uh, uh, there's another level, which is a person who does something without control. Like I'm walking down the hall and I trip, and while I'm falling down, I hit the light switch. So that's not on purpose. That's not even by mistake, because mistake means I either forgot that I can't turn on lights on Shabbos, or I forgot it's Shabbos. I didn't. I fell down. Here, the gravity itself caused me to turn the light on. That's even a lower level. But the middle level, where a person does something by mistake, that's what you offer a sin offering for. And, and the commentary is asked, if you did it by mistake, why should I have to offer a sin offering? Why should I have to give a sacrifice? Because I did it by mistake. I, f I woke up this morning, I forgot it was Shabbos, so I turned on the lights. It's not like I rebelled against God and I turned on the lights. I, it was a mistake. So what's wrong? Why? There's no intent. There's no desire to do wrong. There's no rebelling against God. There's no desire to come out ahead. It's just a mistake. So why would he have to offer a sacrifice? You said, he did a mistake. So the Torah is telling us that when a person does a mistake, it's very rare that there's such a thing as a mistake that you really have no control of. Because most of the time, for instance, if I would tell you that, you know, at, nine, at, at let's say, 11 o'clock today, you won the lottery, at 11 o'clock today, you're going to go down and get a prize. You will get a $100 million check at 11 o'clock. You're not going to forget to go down there at 11 o'clock and get your check, right? You won't forget that. So then how is it, since we know that the keeping of Shabbat is so important and it so, does so much for us that you could forget it's Shabbat? You won't forget to pick up a check, but you'll forget it's Shabbat. How can you forget it's Shabbat? It makes no sense. How do you forget what day it is? The point is, is the reason that you do is because 
it's showing that something is not that important to you. Shabbat is important, but you're saying it's not that important, and you forgot it was Shabbat. And that is the reason that you give the sacrifice, because you have an obligation to be aware of what you're doing. So yes, things happen that you're not thinking about, but you have an obligation to be aware of what you're doing when the, the, the being aware is for the sake of a mitzvah. Right? So therefore, one's allowed to do that. And when you do it by mistake, so therefore you have to give a sacrifice. The set purpose of the sacrifice is to atone for the fact that you made an error in judgment, not that you did anything on purpose. Right? And that's why we offer sacrifice in that case. In the case where someone does something on purpose, we don't offer a sacrifice because that person has a whole process they have to go through first of repentance because they rebelled against God. They told God, I'm going to show you, and they went down and bought McDonald's hamburgers and ate them. Yeah, that's rebelling against God. That's a much more serious thing. And there is no sacrifice for that. And instead, a person has to, has to repent and has to go through a whole process in order to be able to be forgiven for that. So that's, that's also found throughout this whole section. Now these, these sections that we're going through are, appear to be quite mundane because they talk all about sacrifices. There's no stories. There's no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no Bilaam, no Pinchas. There's nothing in this whole book until we get to the next book, right, which will, a couple months, we'll get to. But this one doesn't deal with that at all. It deals really with the, the nuts and bolts of how a Jew practices Judaism with a temple.